afternoon uh, and welcome to the post lunch session um, it's a tough one but i hope you are energized to get into the session and contribute as much uh, for those who i haven't met earlier i am raghav i am from the consulting practice at intellicap uh, what we are going to have here is a panel that will be taking a case based discussion on effective ways of sme financing uh, as we know SMEs require considerable amount of hand-holding, support, capacity building, both pre-investment and post-investment. Uh, the panel here is going to take one case, examine it uh, in that more than money approach, where considerable amount of capacity building services were offered before the fund was raised. Uh, the panel will also closely introduce you to the contours of what this more than money approach is and how sustainable it is to use this in the SME space, not only in Africa, but in other continents as well. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to uh, our moderator, dynamic Andreas Zeller. Uh, he's the managing partner of Open Capital. Uh, Andreas is, has professional experience ranging from private equity, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, as well as investment banking. He worked with Credit Suisse, Citibank, and the IFC before coming to Nairobi and starting uh, Open Capital. So I now leave you in able hands of Andrea Zeller and I ask him to introduce the panel members and get the panel off. Thank you. And, oh, this actually works. Great. Uh, I, you know, what, what I'd like to do is, is go around quickly with introductions uh, and I'll let each of the panelists also introduce themselves. But I think what's exciting is this panel's a bit different from the others, uh, other options, I like to think. So thank you for choosing this one. Uh, we're discussing a, a very practical case. And I've been at a number of conferences that I've never been uh, in a room where you had one panel representing an entrepreneur, an investor, and an advisor, all of whom had partnered and closed a successful investment. In addition to an investor who's seen throughout this market from you know, the earlier days of, of impact investing here, a lot of similar transactions. And so I think we can have a really good discussion. I want to make sure it's really interactive, so we'll leave a lot of time at the end for questions and answers. What we'll do is just go through quick introductions and then address the specific angles of, of this investment and why it happened and what the unique challenges were. Uh, and then go into some of the questions I think you're all wondering about, uh, which, which we'll get to uh, about 20 minute period here that I'll moderate and then open up the floor. Uh, so with that, very briefly on myself, uh, Open Capital Advisors, we've been here four years and we, we are trying to uh, resolve the, the challenging question of this panel. We're trying to fill the gap between investors who want to deploy more fun funds and high impact businesses that can really scale actually like EcoPost has and will uh, and trying to figure out a way of, of getting those two sides together and, and the way we do it is through very intensive operational advice and support for businesses like EcoPost. So we've worked on 85 engagements here across nine countries and, and we, we are based here in Nairobi. But with that, let me pass it on to Lorna who is the CEO of EcoPost and then after that Bruce Campbell who's the Chief Happiness Officer at uh, Blue Dot, and then Lillian Ramba, who is the uh, Africa Manager for Grassroots Business Fund. So with that, let me pass it on to Lorna for a quick intro. Oh. Hi, everyone. Oh, my name is Lorna. Hey, come on, guys, smile. <laughs> I don't know, it looks like you enjoyed your lunch thoroughly. Yeah. My name is Lorna Ruto. Um, I'm just so excited to see all of you. And uh, well, um, I, I grew up in a very humble background and as a child I used to collect plastic and, and make some ornaments and sell. And I grew up uh, loving my hobby until I started, uh, uh, I finally decided to now make it full-time business and uh, I started now, uh, currently what I'm doing is I recycle plastic waste and I manufacture very aesthetic, durable and environmentally friendly plastic lumber. And it has enabled us uh, to have some social impact, uh, environmental and economic impact. We've been able to uh, withdraw over 1.5 million kilograms of plastic so far and uh, uh, employed uh, quite a number of people and also saved some forests. And, uh, um, oh, just introduction. Uh, we managed to get funding due to these wonderful people and uh, Ops and Blue Heaven uh, and uh, uh, Partner desires for that. Thank you very much. So my name is Bruce Campbell. I'm very happy to be on this panel. I'm just going to give a quick pitch for both of these folks who I know well. 
Andreas, with Open Capital, I would put in the top five in terms of effective organizations in this field. And Lorna has proved to be one of my favorite entrepreneurs uh, so far in, in five years of, of working in this field. So, but for me, my, my day job is a, a, a lawyer. I manage a law firm called Blue Dot Advocates. We specialize in the representation of impact investors and social uh, enterprises, just to give you an idea of how busy we are in, in the last Two years, we've done over $100 million in impact capital transactions around the world. Um, but I'm here really in a capacity as uh, investment officer or manager for a family office called Blue Haven. Uh, the last year, I've been playing that role and um, on an interim basis until they hire a full-time deal person. And they've set aside, they're, they're looking to have a, a fully activated impact portfolio across all asset classes and they've set aside 50, 50 million dollars to uh, invest in uh, uh, direct impact deals. So, thanks. Um, my name, <clears throat> sorry, my name is Lillian Mramba. I am the regional manager for Grassroots Business Fund. I've actually also worked quite closely with Andreas and his team um, on various transactions uh, here in, in Kenya. Grassroots Business Fund, just to give you guys a bit of context of where we're coming from, um, we are an investment fund, although we've, we've been around and had different various permutations. We started as a pilot program within the IFC, um, spun out in 2008 and became a not-for-profit organization. We were still making investments um, as a not-for-profit. And in 2011, uh, we're now in our third and, and final phase as an investment fund, so we've raised a fully commercial $49 million fund for deployment across, across the world. Um, and we, we support enterprises that create either incremental incomes or cost savings um, to low-income communities based in uh, India, Indonesia, East Africa, and, and Latin America, Peru, Colombia, uh, Ecuador. So happy to be part of this panel. Thank you. Uh, so you know, what we'd like to do is get into the case side here quickly. Um, you know, what I think many of you are very familiar with is the reality in this market that many businesses have excellent ideas, they have market opportunities that are incredibly clear, that don't even take research to understand, but that are very challenging for investors to come and fund, especially investors who don't have uh, deep local experience or coming or bringing capital from overseas and capital that's used to different types of deals. Much cleaner deals, financials presented right in front of you, years of track record and, and the rest. But often the deals and the, the businesses that have the most opportunity are those that are hardest to invest in. And uh, you know, that's what you find is that it's very challenging for an investor then to directly put capital into a business like that and for that business to scale immediately given that often they've piloted something in the market but they haven't really realized scale. And um, you know, I think EcoPost is an excellent example of that, where certainly we, when we met Lorna and uh, her colleagues, saw a very clear market opportunity. Um, now, that opportunity had been realized to the extent they could, but we saw it at a much greater scale. The issue was that Lorna was having a lot of challenge finding capital to realize that scale, because it took a very early stage investor with a lot of uh, risk tolerance to be able to put that money in. And we were able to play a role to bridge that gap by being an advisor to Lorna and helping set the stage for that growth. So what I wanted to do was uh, let Lorna explain for a couple minutes the challenges she saw as an entrepreneur facing the investor market uh, and the issues that she had as she prepared for scale. And I'm happy to speak just for a couple minutes after about what we were able to do with Lorna at, at Open Capital to reach that. And then Bruce can talk about how he viewed the investment as he came in to make that first investment on behalf of Blue Haven and then approach different investors like Opus, which is in the room, and, and several others to come in alongside to give Lorna the capital that she needed now to grow. Uh, and then at last, I'll pass it on to Lillian, who's seen this sort of similar story across different examples to comment more broadly as we get into the, the broader discussion. So Lorna, back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, try that one. Okay. Great. Thank you. Wow, I like your smiles. <laughs> yeah, so um, true as Andreas has mentioned, we quite had a lot of challenges trying to raise any funds. And um, we were actually ready and we've been planning for the last two years 
this scale up that I was never coming because we were just trying everywhere and you could, we could not easily raise funds. We went to the Kenyan banks and they would ask us for collateral and uh, all these uh, statements that showed how uh, we were making already so much money and all that. There was so much challenges. And uh, even, um, even when we, I got a chance to travel, uh, we would talk to uh, in, uh, people and uh, they would wonder, where is this place in Kenya that you're talking about? Is it a country? <laughs> and uh, it, it, it was quite challenging. And what happened is I got an opportunity to attend uh, the Unreasonable Institute. And that's, a, that's one place whereby I was able to uh, get assistance on how to even pitch and uh, uh, develop your business plan and tell your story. And uh, the, the, the problem with the, why we could not be able to raise funds initially, there was this aspect of people considered a small SME like ours that uh, it was high risk, despite the fact that we already had so much demand for our products, more than our supply could actually meet. The, dis the problem was we were having a capacity challenge. We, could, we did not have capital to purchase the uh, machinery we needed to scale up. So they would, uh, we would talk with various people and they would say, uh, well, we were high risk. And we were maybe far away from the country, among other things. But they, even when we got an opportunity at the Unreasonable, that was not enough to just close the deal, despite the fact that we were also able to say the story. We were not probably able, actually, we were not able to, we did not have enough knowledge and experience to even set some structures such as term, term sheet for asking, giving an ask to the investor and requesting, a, this is what you need. And what happened is we were not able to make the investor understand that our business was attractive and it was sustainable and we could not provide maybe the value of the company, the exit. We were not able to give a good pre a package presentation and uh, if it wasn't for the unreasonable to go there and meet some wonderful, uh, very handsome, kind lawyer. <laughs> See why I like her so much? <laughs> Yeah, Bruce is actually a godsend gift to Ecopus because uh, he called later after we were left to go back to the country after meeting all these wonderful people. Uh, he called and asked, how has it been? I, I, uh, how, are you, how have you been with this fundraising? And I told him we are still struggling despite the fact that we had excited a lot of people with our social environment and uh, economic impact that we would already achieved at that point. So uh, it was easy to get the excitement, but uh, what about the ask? We couldn't do the ask, and uh, Bruce uh, pushed us along, and uh, he not only just pushed us with a term sheet and structuring our business, he put us in the capable of hands of OCA to help us structure a detailed business plan that would help us to give to the uh, um, investors. Uh, we also were able to do our financial structures appropriately, we were able to actually sell our business and the more we worked with him, we were reading it and we were getting shocked at what capability we actually had. <laughs> and uh, eventually we were able to close uh, um, some financing and we are looking forward to go out there and utilize this finance to uh, increase our impact and create as many jobs as possible, especially for the people in the marginalized areas and solve the environmental issues of this waste that litters and clogs our sewers and even encroach people's homes. And best of all, we hope we'll save all the forests that have been cut so that it reduces from that 2% to 10 or let's say 100. Thank you very much. Please clap for me. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Work. Thanks, Lorna. Uh, you know, I, the perspective I just wanted to share quickly, uh, we, we were brought in and uh, Lorna had something that many, many SMEs don't, which is she'd actually been able to set up a, a business that was profitable, that was operating, and, and interestingly was basically at full capacity. Uh, and she was doing something that, that we absolutely believe in, and, and judging by this conference, I think many people believe in, uh, which is, you know, everywhere you go, you see waste plastic. That's clear. There, there's a huge market for waste plastic. And what she's doing is she's converting it into products that not only are in high demand, but replace something else that is inferior and also detrimental to the environment, which is just timber posts. Uh, but the issue was, 
you can't sell a story to investors by just saying that we're at max capacity, we need to double that, and there's enough input around, and it's a clear opportunity. <clears throat> so what we were able to do is, is work extremely closely with, with Lorna and, and actually quantify a lot of that. You know, not only is there a lot of plastic, but let's look at that whole industry. Turns out they're plastic yards and, and dump sites. Well, who runs those dump sites, and then how can we extend relationships with them? How can we actually even look at working capital commitments to those dump sites to better manage longer-term partnerships so we secure our supply of input at similar pricing? How then on the production side can we maximize production, keep increase margins, make sure that when we increase capacity, we're not just doing it line by line, but we're actually looking at equipment that itself is going to be an investment in the next three to five years, not just sort of a, you know, the cheapest equipment we can get that will, that will produce. How can we look at new products and prioritize which of those new products you send to the market and when? Um, you know, these are all things that, that took a lot of rigor and analysis to figure out. And these were exactly the things, in our minds, investors would, would require from the company. And what we were able to do together is plan an operational strategy for the next three to five years. In, in great detail, month by month, thinking about what production, when does it increase, how much is required to increase it, how do we expand the technical capacity, when do we make key hires as an organization, planned all that out in a lot of detail. Uh, and we're able to then deliver to investors, I guess what you call a business plan, but really more of an operational plan that said, as soon as you give us as much money, here's what we're going to do with it in great detail, and here's what will result from that again in great detail. And I think that's what really was, was able to attract the investor interest because albeit you know, people were looking at a risky company, it was a risky company with a very clear plan that mitigated a lot of that downside. And that's really our goal, is to work on all different sides of a business as actively often as, as the executors and try and take what they know best and structure it, order it, and create a plan for scale that is actually something that Lorna is, 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 feels comfortable achieving. Uh, and, uh, and I like to think we did that because when we went to investors, we were able to have really productive discussions and, and uh, you know, Bruce had engaged us to do the work and so we were already in very close talks with him. But after we were able to produce that plan, we were able to get immediately to the level of detail of, you know, okay, what does the structure have to look like? How can we narrow in the terms of this investment to make sense? How can we tranche the investment and bring on co-investors? which is why we then reached out to Opus Fund, uh, which saw the opportunity to come in alongside as an, uh, a co-investor, and then a couple others, and, and really form a consortium to get the capital in place and the equipment ordered. And today, we're waiting for that equipment to come to multiply capacity by many times, and we already have a list of customers that, uh, that will probably put us at full capacity again soon. So we might go back out to the capital markets, and this time at a next level of growth, and that to us is the true excitement. So, you know, I think by our coming in, we, our effort was to try and mitigate the risk and give Lorna a plan that she might not otherwise have had time to really structure and develop in the way that we did, but that gave investors the comfort to come in and gave her the freedom to actually operate her business. So that was a bit of our role, both pre- and post-investment, in just making sure that that initial upswing happened. But I want to pass it on to Bruce, uh, who was able to see both EcoPost before, bring us on, see the process, and then evaluate the deal on behalf of Blue Haven and then actually make the investment. And I think Lorna and Andreas uh, very well articulated both the challenges uh, that we faced prior to investment and also the benefit of, of engaging with open capital. And maybe just to give you a bit more context about, about Blue Haven and how we, we, we came to engage with, um, with open capital. So we had a situation where where the family members behind Blue Haven and, and other advisors met Lorna in Boulder, Colorado, really liked her, saw that she had clear leadership skills, real passion for the business, and she was also telling a story of this business that was not only having a, a kind of interesting and compelling social impact, but was actually profitable. And she was telling us the problem was we don't have enough uh, capacity to produce the goods for the, to satisfy the demand. So, but what we didn't have is we didn't have, as Lorna said, really anything to document that story. We didn't have historical financial statements. We didn't have uh, a financial model to show us how the, the future might play out. We didn't have any kind of real um, documented strategy, you know, kind of growth plan. So um, in Blue Haven, at, you know, at that time, EcoPost was actually one of their first investments. And so Blue Haven didn't have an in-house diligence team, didn't, did not have a, an analyst. 
Um, and also, you know, is still learning about, about the deal pr process and how to structure deals. And so ultimately my proposition to them was, you all like Lorna, I think it makes sense to invest in doing some due diligence to see if we can verify the story that she's telling us. Um, and they were willing to, to make that investment in hiring open capital. A and, and the way that we structured that was Blue Haven would advance the fees for open capital to do their engagement, which would be both kind of the investor facing, you know, diligence, helping us to assess the valuation of the company, but also the having a second purpose of providing a strategic plan for the business, providing a financial model for them to work with, and providing a short-term execution plan. So it had benefits for both investors and the company. And so Blue Haven advanced the fee, but with the understanding that, that if Blue Haven made the investment, then that fee would be, would be credited towards the investment. So whatever amount of money we spent on the engagement, we would then get that much in, in principal amount of debt or, or stock. Um, and I actually think that that particular way to structure it worked very well because it, it, it required Lorna and Charles, her co-founder, to really buy in themselves. Um, they, had to, they had to see the value themselves of open capital. And because, you know, really the money was, being, was coming out of the, the proceeds of the investment, so essentially being paid by all the stakeholders, you know, they were serious. They wanted to get value out of this engagement. Um, and I think we were very lucky that just that, that the, the two teams, the EcoPost team and the Open Capital team, worked very well together. On the investment structure, it might be just worth saying a couple of things about the investment structure. We, there, was, there was talk of maybe doing this as a debt investment, given the fact that it was already a profitable business. It seemed to, that from a cash flow standpoint, we, we could get a, a reasonable return on kind of a midterm um, uh, loan. And there are a couple reasons why we, we, we decided to ultimately to do equity. One is for tax reasons. We saw that, at least for the US investors, we'd be looking at probably uh, $70,000 in additional tax if we did it as debt as opposed to equity. Um, and then we'd also have you know, the disadvantage of the withholding in Kenya on the interest payments. Um, you know, we also saw that this was a you know, business where we probably could have a short-term exit, but we also saw the opportunity for something greater and thought that we might want to be along for, for a greater expansion of the, of the business in Kenya or, or maybe uh, developing multinational strategy. So we wanted to have that ability to, to stay along for that longer ride. And, and what we came up with is kind of an interesting, I think interesting structure since I designed it, but um, you know, where um, we had a redemption feature, and, and initially it was, we had had in the term sheet as, as a put, where the investors could force a uh, repurchase of the stock after, after five years at a pre-agreed upon rate. And what we found was that, that that's our lawyers in, in Kenya told us that is actually illegal under Kenya law, that the, that the stockholders cannot force a redemption. And so what we were left with though, ultimately is something I think I like more, and is actually more balanced, where the company has to, uh, only the company can initiate the redemption, but the investor has to accept the purchase offer. So, which means, effectively what that means is there has to be mutual agreement by the company and the investor to do this redemption. Now we did build in a mechanism where we could, if needed, apply a little bit of pressure uh, uh, to encourage a redemption in that the investors have the ability to force the company to reserve a certain amount of money out of free cash flow to fund a redemption, which means if the investors wanted to, uh, to redeem, they could start building this reserve and then the company would presumably have an incentive to use that reserve to do the redemption because there's nothing else they can do with the cash. So, okay. Just get this on. Thanks, Bruce. Um, pass it to Lillian for a second. You know, I think uh, this is one case, this is one example with, uh, and we wanted to make it as specific as possible to make it tangible. Um, hate when things aren't too tangible. Um, but I, I think, you know, we want to also get to a couple of the broader points. And maybe Lillian, you can speak for a couple of minutes about your, um, your experience uh, looking at difficult deals and, 
and considering pre-investment TA, whether it be committing more of your own team time to trying to work with those businesses or engaging other advisors in terms of trying to get an opportunity you really believe in to the point where you could potentially fund it. Yeah, so we, um, I mean, GBF, we, we typically don't invest in early stage ventures. We, we usually invest in growth stage companies that have been around for two to three years that are really looking for the next uh, type of capital to help them scale. But even, even having said that, we still do run into problems where you know, the companies haven't quite thought through the operational plan, as, as Andreas put it, and they need a little bit of help and tweaking um, on that operational plan for us to be able to present a credible case for investment. Now, um, GBF, we, we have our own due diligence team, so we do our diligence in-house, um, but sometimes um, either we just don't have the expertise, for example, we don't have the expertise in setting up abattoirs, uh, this is a current you know, transaction that we're looking at, where we really then need to work with experts, you know, it could be folks like OCA or others to help us do that in-depth um, analysis and planning that we need. In other cases, we, we will work closely with the companies to help them um, shape out the strategy that we, we need in order for us to make the investment case. Um, for, for us, the, the, the more we can do in-house, in uh, the, the better it is for us because that's also the time for us to really demonstrate the value that we're bringing to the transaction and also it's a time for us to um, build the relationship with the entrepreneur and really getting to know sort of who they are, their, their motivations and how it is that we're going to work together in this partnership. But rightly so, if, if, the, if the needs of the company is, is for someone to put together a, a five-year detailed operational plan, we simply just don't have that, that bandwidth to do it all in-house, and so we do have to work with external folks. The, the question that, that you know, often comes up is then who pays for it? Um, and, and, and who absorbs that additional cost. Uh, one, one thing that I didn't mention, and if you're in the angel um, panel right, right before lunch, is, is grant funding, which I, I, I guess from that panel evokes a very harsh reaction when you talk about combining grant, grant capital and investment capital. But at, at GBF, we, that's, that's our, our model. We've raised grant funding uh, with the understanding that the companies that we invest in do need capacity building, and sometimes that needs to happen before you make the investment. And, and for us to engage folks like OCA and other experts and advisors to work with our companies, you know, it's, it's really just not commercially sustainable for us to do it off of just a purely um, sort of fund structure, and so we do need donors and, and, and grantors to come in and, and cover part of that cost. The, the issue of alignment of incentive that you talked about is, is key. So even when we do fund these um, advisory services with, with grant funding, we make sure that the, the interests are aligned across all three parties. So ourselves, um, the advisor who's working with the companies and the companies themselves. By setting up performance-based based structures, we can, we can talk about that um, later in, into, into um, the discussion. But we don't do this very often because, um, quite frankly, sometimes we, we, you spend time uh, working with companies and you don't end up closing the deal. Um, and, and that's just, it's, it, so we have to make the assessment of what is the probability for us to, of closing this deal once we do the advisory work before um, spending too much sort of time and resources on that. So those are some of the, the challenges that we face. And, and sometimes we have to walk away from a really good deal because either requires way too much time, too much funding, um, and we, we aren't able to justify it because we, we can't say that um, even after we've done all this work that would actually make, make the investment. And so the question, I guess, uh, that we can address later is then who should cover uh, for the cost of that, of, of that advisory work pre-investment. Pre Thanks, Lillian. And, and just before we get to that question, which is, I think, a very valid one, and certainly uh, you know, always top of mind for us as well, I just want to ask uh, Lorna one question, which is about timing of these advisory services. Oftentimes, in terms of your growth cycle as a business, you're a very thin team because you can't afford uh, really top-notch talent early on, especially in areas like uh, financial management and, and other functions. 
So you know, as you obviously prove your growth, you can ramp up the team. But how do you view the role of an advisor at various stages of your own growth versus hiring? And, and now that you have sort of approach growth, how, is, how, how has that played out through this engagement? Oh, and let me pass you a, actually, that one works, yeah. Well, um, I feel that uh, uh, like the input you brought into EcoPost was very important. I don't know how we would have done and how we would have known now how our projections look like. There's so much work. I was shocked because I tried even to do one presentation the other day. <laughs> and I found myself sleeping two hours in four days. You can imagine. I looked like Bruce after this jet lag. <laughs> Yeah, it was so difficult because um, I've not had experience and the knowledge to be able to gather and write all these financial statements, balance sheets, cash flows that the investors require. And uh, it takes a lot of time to do that, when, and which steals a lot of time from just, can you imagine we have like around only four management team? It takes a lot of time uh, away from building the business, our core business, which is recycling plastic. Not, I'm not an uh, AFC banker. You were AFC banker before? Congrats, wow. <laughs> they did wonderful work. And um, I feel the initial stage for uh, a business trying to close a deal like that, and they need to even close an investment, I think it's very important. Um, after you've helped us and structured and uh, helped us to plan our growth, and uh, uh, goals and how we are going to uh, market our products, uh, the industry, how we're going to, uh, all the, that, that we did. I think after now you've helped us to move into that stage. Um, right now I don't feel we'll need so much of that as compared to how we really desperately needed it in, initially. Because I don't think we'll be able to sell if it wasn't for your output or to close any deal before that. So I feel it's very important in the f initial stage. And I, 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 I'm, right now, I cannot say um, good to go. Um, like I'm not very sure. I'll wait for the next board meeting. If I'm fired, I think I'll come back to you. <laughs> but in, in the meantime, I think um, it's very important for the initials, the first beginning stage uh, before the entrepreneurs can go on. Did I answer? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks. And can I just add something? Please do. No, I was just going to say, we. Uh, you know, open capital is very, very impressive, and, and uh, at probably our initial board meeting, we had open capital make a presentation, and they, they more or less ran the board meeting. And, and Liesl, who's one of the family principals, she said to me after, wow, that's really impressive. I, you know, it really gives me a great deg degree of confidence to know that open capital is engaged. And, and we had, we then started talking about, well, maybe we, should we have open capital do an ongoing, um, play an ongoing advisory role to EcoPost uh, to provide kind of support on strategy, accounting, finance, and um, and we ultimately ultimately left it up to to Lorna and Charles to make that decision. It wasn't something that we really wanted to, to force on them, and they decided against it. They they decided it wasn't you know maybe there would come a time in the future where it would make sense to re-engage with open capital, especially when maybe some more strategic advice was needed. But for the time being, they felt like they had a clear plan that they could execute against. Um, and, and so again, so we, we declined to do uh, the ongoing open capital services. And, um, and I will say, I mean, Lorna and Charles, and they, they then, you know, I think having the board meeting that, that open capital essentially ran and having also kind of a model that was presented, Lorna and Charles did their first, first board presentation a couple days ago, and they nailed it. I mean, they... So they are able to kind of work from the framework that was established by, by Open Capital and then, and then run the meeting themselves. And I, I feel very confident that's going to happen on the operational level as well. Thanks. Uh, and you know, that, that's also what we try and do from our perspective. We try and uh, essentially do a good enough job to not be needed next time around. And I know that sounds very counterintuitive, but that's really what's needed in a scalable business. We're not the business. Lorna is the business. And if we represent and that, you know, I'm, I'm the one presenting to the investor and I do all the work, then maybe the investor, if I've done my job well, has no doubt that I'm really good at it. But at the end of the day, that's not the point. And so at, whenever we represent a business, maybe the first meeting is one where we're, we're pitching the business for an investor, but the second meeting is absolutely with Lorna actually sitting at the table. And I think 
uh, you know, we've, the big challenge in our business model is we've had to figure out when we're needed and when we're not at various stages of growth and, and also various investment needs. You know, for example, we've worked for investors who are bringing $10 million into the market. They want to fund three businesses across one value chain and they, they all live in London. You know, for that model, they need us to go in and do a tremendous amount of work to actually merge these businesses, set everybody up for growth, get the partnerships, get everything rolling, and deploy that, that form of capital. Uh, in other cases, it's about getting all the fundamental pieces right with one business like Lorna's, like Ecopost, and then stepping out. Uh, and, and oftentimes, that takes place at the occasion of investment. And the segue I'm making here is, is that of costs, because to do what we do well, we realize, and this is the only reason I think we've been around for four years now without having raised a single grant and expanded to a team of 14 people, is because we need to find really, really good people, international quality people. We hire from the Kenyan universities, but we really do hire top notch. We screen for a long time to get that talent. And we hire people from all around the world with backgrounds at the McKinsey's of the world, the Goldman's, all these different firms, uh, and throughout Africa. Of course, paying them is expensive. And the only way to make our model sustainable is to be very conscious of our own margins in doing work. Now, the, the most critical thing for us is the amount of time it takes to actually execute against this. And you know, from our perspective, when investors and businesses come to us, they, of course, don't want to pay that much in advance of a deal because they don't know if the deal is going to go well. And so it's a challenge, but we bear the risk. And we're comfortable bearing a certain amount of that risk. So we'll often defer our fees for a year. Uh, the only re reason we're able to do that is because we're so convinced that our work will lead to success. But that risk is very dangerous because I am an entrepreneur. I have to make payroll as well. And that's just a reality a lot of people tend to ignore, but you know, we don't have a big, big dad, third party in there, kind of rich uncle to help us out. And so you know, at the end of the day, it's really that tough, tough discussion with somebody like a Bruce or a Lorna, depending on who we're engaged with, to say, we could certainly help you out. We could do a lot of great work here. Uh, but it's going to take six months of our team time, and, and that means that's time away from a different client, and we have to, to bill for it. We've been able to make our fees as efficient as possible, and I think very efficient compared to certainly international standards and, and many others in the space, but it's still a cost. And I think where the cost really hits home is when the investors start talking with the businesses about who pays. Now, We've engaged on 85 engagements. 55 of those have been unique for businesses directly. So people like Lauren have hired us without anybody else funding it. And we've taken a lot of the risk. We haven't charged them up front. We've kind of staggered fees and all of that sort of work. In 13, 14 different cases, it's been investors who've come in and partially, if not fully, paid for us to work with the business. And, and what I'd love to hear from first Lillian and then Bruce about is, when you face that difficult question of you see a business, you believe in it, it's great. You have advisors, people capable in the market, whether your own team or not. Um, but the business really balks at the idea of funding the majority of the bill up front. How you consider your willingness to invest at that stage and what kind of growth potential you think you need to believe in the business in order to make that upfront investment. Just to answer your, your first question, because that I had an immediate reaction to it. I think if a company, oh, you, have, you have to understand the motivations, but I think if a company hesitates to pay for something, it, it'd be highly unlikely that we would pay for it. Um, just because it, it, it means they don't see the value in the work. Um, they don't see the value in the work because the buying isn't there yet, or we just haven't done a good job to explain why it is that they need whatever it is that we're, we're asking um, to get done. In, in, in those cases, we, we never fund any piece of work out of our own pocket because we think the success of the implementation of the work is actually very, very low if the company in itself doesn't have skin in the game. So all of, our, all of, all of the work that we do pre or post investments are cost shared with the company. Um, oftentimes, the company has to pay up front and we reimburse the company upon... Um, upon achievement of certain performance indicators. I, I talked about this earlier. And actually what, what we've done, which works really well, is we agree on success factors for, for a piece of work. Um, the consultant gets paid by the company only after he's um, seen results. 
and we reimburse the company after they've paid the consultant. You know, that way we make sure that everybody has sort of done, done their piece of work. So absolutely not. We, we, we wouldn't do it if the company doesn't want to pay for it. Now, if in the, in the instance where you know, we, we agree to cost share, um, we, we, I would say we, we have to be pretty confident that we, that we can close the deal. And this is a scalable um, enterprise for us to do any pre-investment work because the, the grant funding that we've raised in our advisory work is really for companies that are within our portfolio. And so we, we just don't have the resources uh, team-wise or otherwise to, to work with companies that are not going to be a part of our portfolio. So we have to be pretty confident that this is a, this is a highly scalable enterprise and, and, it's, and it's a deal that we, we, it's worth for us to take, take the investment up front. I think for Blue Haven it's probably a little bit different again because Blue Haven doesn't have an in-house diligence team. Um, it, you know, for us advancing the fees, one, I don't think EcoPost had the resources to 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 pay the fees at that time. And again, I think, a, you know, some portion of the value and a lot of the value was on the investor side and and on the diligence side. And so, that seemed like a risk that that uh, that we as investors should be be willing to take. Um, and, you know, one way that, and we've done two engagements with OCA now, we, we've, and the second one, I think there was, I think we all, with EcoPost, I think there was a fair degree of confidence that it would become an investment and one that had uh, a great potential for success. We also hired OCA in a second engagement where that proposition was a little less clear and, and to some extent it was a little bit more of a, a roll of the dice and I, I, I think um, and really motivated and the reason why we were, we were willing to take the risk was one we just felt strongly in supporting this particular entrepreneur. Um, again we liked, well, liked the impact but we had a lot less clarity on, on how the business worked and, and what we did there though is to, to mit mitigate the risk is we shared the cost with another investor. So we, you know, talked in our community of, of kind of colleagues and co-investors and, and we split the cost for, for the OCA work. So again, that was a way for us to, to mitigate the risk. And I think, you know, what we ended up paying is, you know, half the OCA's fees. Again, from my, my perspective is, is certainly a reasonable due, dil due diligence fee. And I also think from the Blue Haven perspective, um, they feel good about leaving the company with some value, even if even if Blue Haven doesn't invest. Invest. I think they feel good about the fact that the company can then take this this information and try to raise money from other other investors. I was just going to mention. Um, I I, th I thought it was great that you guys folded the cost of the advisory work into into the investment amount because that's one way to get around. You know, the company doesn't have the resources to pay for the advisory work, but they really value it. Um, and just have them fold that into the investment manner. I thought that was a great solution. Okay, good. Uh, just maybe one last uh, question before we turn it over uh, to the audience for, I think we've, we finished at 3.15, is that right? So we, we about 15, 20 minutes for questions after. Uh, you know, the question is just when we look at this at scale, and, and I think the challenge is that there, for all the real prepared, wonderful, polished investment opportunities that you see out there, there are probably a hundred <laughs> that are, might be interesting but have various challenges and, and where pretty intensive work up front would be needed. As, as you both look from the funding angle at potentially scaling the amount of funds you deploy in these regions, uh, how would you, what sort of solution do you think is possible on the pre-investment side to scale your own fund? fund deployment insofar as do you think it's an outsourcing model? Do you think it's an in-house model? Are you just going to sort of wait it out and be patient to find entrepreneurs who can grow themselves? Uh, how would you view basically the challenges we've been discussing at, at a bit more scale? Is it, a, is it about sharing across various investors, structuring around the problems? Maybe both of you uh, can comment uh, on how you see that at a bit more scale. Personally, I, I don't think there's a better use of philanthropic capital than, than um, finding a way to pay people like Andreas to do this work. And, and maybe it's not even a 
philanthropic capital. I mean, there's been discussion, for example, of a of a TA, a technical technical assistance fund, um, and and where where the money would be advanced for the technical assistance to a company, but the company would have an obligation to repay it, and with interest, and maybe there'd be some kind of warrant coverage. But but I, you know, in my mind, I mean, you know, you always hear this conversation about investors say there aren't enough investable deals. Um, and entrepreneurs say there's not enough money, right? And, and to me, this is, this is how you bridge that gap, right? It is you take a deal that really like Lorna's, which, you know, it seemed not investable, but really only because, you know, she just didn't have the skills herself to put together, as she said, the kind of packaging or, or presentation. So it took a relatively small intervention to take a deal from investable to one that we had, it was very easy to syndicate this deal once we had, you know, the kind of the, the input and the formal presentation materials from Open Capital. So, and I think, you know, and there's a lot of talk about accelerators. Accelerators have their place. I, I frankly think that they're, they're best at kind of convening and introducing entrepreneurs to people and, and, and networks that can be helpful. But in terms of like actually getting the work done of, of, of making a company investable, I think to some degree you get what you pay for and I think there's just nothing that replaces having paid expertise that can come in and do this work. I think you just get a lot more value for the money than, for example, supporting someone through an accelerator program. And again, not to knock accelerators, but um, I, you know, and I, you know, I love the, for example, the Unreasonable Institute guys. But I think I think about the cost to attend the Unreasonable Institute, and for the same amount of money, you could pay you could pay Andreas to do his initial engagement. Um, where you come out with this very polished product and also his network to help introduce you to, to funding sources. So, um, yeah, so I would love to see a fund. I would love to see more money flowing into technical assistance. I think it'd be hugely valuable. valuable. Yeah, so I'll definitely second um, the, the use of technical assistance and grant funding for advisory services on, on the pre-investment side. I would also add maybe a, a bit of a controversial topic of maybe even the use of grant funding um, to act as first loss. Uh, first loss is, is not a good word. Uh, uh, B tranche. <laughs> B tranche, uh, underlying tranche for the in investors to encourage them to take um, risks that they wouldn't have otherwise had by providing just a little bit of risk capital underneath the, the investors and encouraging investors to to look at deals that, that they wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah. I think both those two th could be pretty good use of philanthropic capital. Thanks, that's a, a very interesting and, and probably controversial topic, and I think everybody has a lot of views on it. So I'd like to use our last 15, 20 minutes for any of your questions. Uh, what I'd ask is just raise your hand. If you want to address it to one of us, uh, mention that person's name. Otherwise, we'll just uh, choose uh, among us who's best to address it. Jason. Small world here. I'm wondering, Andreas, as you get more and more engagements and more people interested in utilizing OCA to source to source deals for you, has there ever been discussion of compensating you partially in equity to make sure that you're aligned with the long term success of the company? And would you be open to that? Understanding the cash flow is an issue for you, but in terms of you know sharing diligence costs and making sure that you're bringing good deals to the table, has that been discussed? That's a great question. And Maybe I'll answer that and we'll go one by one, at least at the start. Um, you know, we've never taken equity, and we made a very conscious decision not to when we started for a couple of reasons. You mentioned working capital. I think that's interesting. Equity investors wait a long time to get their money back, say five years, seven years. Maybe they never get it back. Debt investors, a little bit less so. Advisors, a very different business where literally you're paying your staff in exchange for selling your time. If you start deferring a large chunk of that, that payment, you're not getting upside and you're not paying your staff and you fold. And so waiting for half of our fees over, say, more than a year-long year, year -long period is, is very difficult, unless, of course, you have substantial backing. And, and we were coming into this business with our credit cards and related debt. And that just is not a way without deep pockets to fund long exposure. That said, I also i am not convinced about the idea of equity from an advisor's perspective. In this market, our hope is to work with many businesses across different industries, and we've been able to do that. Um, 
you know, yes, we get very deeply engaged with businesses, but we don't sit on their boards or have substantial stakes. And, and it's very useful for us to know that we can work across a sector like agribusiness with different types of producers and processors and so on without being seen as being biased or backing only one party instead of another. It doesn't mean, of course, that we're going to work in a directly competitive niche, but it does give us more freedom to work across and have impact more broadly than if we were to have with equity. And we've seen that so profoundly in the market through just examples that it's reinforced our decision not to, to pursue that path. You could argue for a hybrid model, and that's what merchant banks have done in different markets, where you do a bit of both, where you are an investor as well as an advisor, and you can play that hybrid. But often conflict of interest pop up in that case, and we're also very weary and, and want to make sure we're very clear, clearly on one side or another of those deals. Milton. Hi, Milton Lorre from the Kenya Feed the Future Innovation Engine. I've got a couple of questions, one to Andreas. Um, the 55 or, or so uh, enterprises that you mentioned that sort of came to you and engaged you, how, how did they come? Did they know who you are? Uh, did someone refer them to you? Essentially, how are people finding out about you, the, the entrepreneurs? Um, and uh, a sort of a second question, um, Bruce sort of alluded to it in terms of amount, um, you know, the, the amount of uh, pre-investment TA from a value perspective, either an actual number or as a percentage of the actual deal, deal size. Uh, how much does it cost to actually do pre-investment TA in terms of the, the size of the deal that eventually get, gets done? Um, just a very brief answer on the 55, and I'll pass it on to, to Bruce and or Lillian. Um, we, we entered the market, and the first couple came from investors themselves. Uh, we were speaking with people like, like Lillian's team and others, and, and they said, I would love to invest in this business. They're amazing, but I can't. Wouldn't it be great if somebody did this? And frankly, that's what convinced me to come here in the first place. I, we all had decent jobs elsewhere and saw this as such a tremendous opportunity that we quit and came out here. And, uh, and you know, a lot of that started things off, but what was really powerful is good work led so quickly to reputation that uh, we became basically fully at capacity and have been ever since to the extent that we unfortunately often have to turn down work, uh, which would be very interesting. And we're building up a team and we'll be 25 by the end of this year, so we really are scaling to, to manage that. Uh, but we found that word of mouth across these industries, especially among CEOs who tend to know other CEOs, uh, is very powerful. When you think about all the interconnected points, you know, might have a business that's sourcing from a major supplier or has major customers, and those customers are across industries, but they themselves are SMEs. And that, that Milton, is kind of long story short how, how people have come to us. As we scale, uh, it really has been our level of operational involvement in the marketplace. For your second question, which was amount of TA is percent of deal size or amount of that total commitment, either any of the three of you, open the floor. For us, because most of our um, advisory work is post-investment, on the pre-investment side, uh, we, we wouldn't spend more than 1% or 2% um, of, the, of the deal amount on, on pre-investment work, which then really influences the types of... Uh, there can't be too much work that needs to be done. The, the, the enterprise has to be fairly um, in, in, a, in a decent shape, um, even, even when it needs advisory services, because we just don't have much of a, uh, we don't have a lot of resources to spend on the pre-investment side. I'll say, first of all, I just had a brilliant idea. Um, and this was, I, just, I mean, I'm saying that tongue in cheek because I'm not that brilliant, but, but and it's actually based on thinking about the unreasonable institute and feeling a little bit guilty uh, um, about what I said, um, and you know, but they do this thing called the marketplace, where they, because um, I think the tuition, at least I don't know, last year, was ten thousand dollars to attend the market, uh, to attend the institute. Plus, you had to fly there from wherever you live, and so it's a it's a big commitment. But what they do is they uh, allow they have a platform where their fellows can can seek funding through the Unreasonable Institute website, and I think it's. I guess it's grant funding, right? I think the, the you know the, the donations are tax deductible, and but I you know and I've seen uniformly over the, the three or four years of this, of this doing of doing this, all of the fellows have have raised the 
the tuition amount, and they've also been able to often raise additional amounts to fund their transportation. So I was just thinking you could do some sort of crowdsourced technical assistance platform where you have, you know, the company, there's a website and the company says, this is what I do, you know, I recognize I need some help, uh, are you willing to pay towards supporting whatever I need to get, to get Andreas's help? So, um, do you really want me to say what we paid you? Is that, because that, that could... <laughs> what I would just say in terms of pricing is, we, we struggle, well, I, I, and, and yes, I, you know, so I guess, long story short, I don't mind, but the slight, slight caveat to that is, I don't think we've almost ever charged the exact same price twice. And the reason for that is people never ask us for the same thing twice. It's always a different business, it's always a different reality, and it's always a different amount of work. And the thing that we've gotten best at, and I would say, to be very honest, our main barrier to entry, if you're assessing us as a business, is, is the ability to scope out a project effectively before you engage in it. And we have gotten that wrong so many times, let me tell you, we've done hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of work over years for businesses and gotten paid 5% of that, maybe. We, we've gotten, been so in the red and we've had to work for no salary. That's, that's a repercussion. I've had to pay my rent out of my savings for a long time. But I think the reality is you get better at that. And, and while you might slip up initially because you believe that a business is so close to investment and you don't see the, the nuances that require all that much work, you have to get better at scoping it out. And now after four years, we, we've gotten very good to the point where we track our time and are very, very close to that upfront, upfront uh, consideration. We do our diligence on every investment uh, that we make in terms of engagements. Um, so for example, in EcoPost, we didn't just engage from day one. We met Lorna, we got the documents, we understood the business, where are the gaps, what do we have to fill? And I translated that into what members of our team have to do what work. And we have our own leverage structure internally as a team. And, and only after that equation was I comfortable with a certain fee range. And that changes all the time. And I would say that the challenge is everybody comes up to us and says, wouldn't it be great if you had a standardized offering? But that's not the reality of the market. We can't charge $10,000 a time because you might have some higher and some lower. And you know, reality is in our business, it has to be very tailored. And so it, because of that, you know, we, we can almost never quote just up front because it's not, not fair to us as we estimate how much is required. So not, not, not a way of get, getting out of kind of the real numbers, but a way of, of being very clear that, that our business model has to be based that way. Now, I'll say from the Blue Haven perspective, again, very reasonable, especially considering that we don't have our own in-house diligence team. And you know, it's probably the, you know, a business class and a half, you know, cost of a business class and a half ticket. Um, so, from the U.S. Hi, I'm Jacob from the Shell Foundation in Delight. I'm curious what role exit planning plays in an engagement like this. Presumably, Bruce and Lillian, you're both very interested in steps towards getting a return on your investment. So I'm curious what role that plays, and maybe Lorna, you could give some perspective on how you interact with, with that kind of planning. Sorry? No, I was going to say my, my answer is very uh, short because we, we do, we're a mezzanine investor, so we don't do pure equity investments, uh, which means that most of our investment, all of our investment structures, we get liquidated from the company's own cash flows. And so we don't have a typical exit uh, where we, we sell a company to a, to a, to a trade buyer or, or IPO or anything like that. We usually get, get paid back, get redeemed from the company's cash flows. Yeah, I think for us, um, and again, the, the structure we came up with, Lorna, um, we could, you know, the opportunity to exit in a relatively short period of time if we want to take, take our cash out, let's say, after, after five years, but the flexibility to stay in as a longer-term equity in, investor and, and help, help build uh, a company longer term. So, so we opted for that flexibility. But I, I, mean, I think generally in this space that I, I think the... Uh, Situations in which we're going to see tr kind of traditional exits in the sense of a 
sale of a company or public offering, I think, are so rare that investors really need to be thinking in almost all of their investors investments, how do they get their, look, their money out absent one of those exit events? So. And maybe just learn to translate that. Um, how do you look at 10 years from now? <laughs> you know, I mean, the investors are talking of exit. This is your business. How do you view the sort of longer term? Well, um, I think um, I feel it's very fair because this kind, uh, the kind of investors I got, uh, investors who are working with us to actually uh, build this business. It's not just people who are uh, seated over there and telling you to do this and boss you from US. At least they have been coming in, diving in into the business and going with me into the dump site to check out material. Though Bruce doesn't like that so much. No, no, I love that. No, I really do. <laughs> So I, I, I don't know, I'm just I'm so excited about this team and I see us going places together and I'm not even, I'm feeling uh, I got more than I bargained for actually. Uh, initially I was thinking, whoa, OCA is charging all this, but after you see the value that they have added into this business, I cannot even believe what I would have done without that. Thank you. So I think we've got about five minutes. So what? I guess we'll do is take three questions and I'll write them down and we'll address them all in, in bulk if you have three questions. Are there any other questions? If not, we can uh, have it sooner. Hi, my name is Magda Tsugai. I'm with USAID Kenya. I'm afraid my question is going to take you a little bit to the com uh, controversial territory that at least two of you have already alluded to. Um, I just wanted to get your, your sense of um, what you've, how you view uh, the role of development partners in um, promoting social entrepreneurship using catalytic funds that, you know, the likes of uh, Feed the Future Innovation Engine, for instance, that combine grants as well as technical assistance uh, for a certain period of time to, to really promote um, development agenda forward. It, it's a very generic question, I know, but but I'd like to hear a little bit about your thoughts in terms of your experience. Do you see this trend as being um, one that should be sort of um, promoted, or does it have a just you know uh, uh, a negative effect in terms of the market? Because there there are different you know school of thoughts on this. So I'd like to hear your thoughts. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any other questions I can take down before we respond to that? Well, certainly a, a good one to end on. I think we'll all have, please, yep. Are there other issues that, that you see coming up that um, entrepreneurs, particularly social entrepreneurs, particularly need help with, do you think? Thanks. Let's, uh, maybe we'll take, take the first one first and, and then answer your question. Thank you for that. Uh, just from my perspective, I've often looked at developed markets and tried to, to, to view the role of TA there. And what you find is the private equity industry does a lot of this in-house and or outsources, but a lot of it's in-house. And the reason is because the markets are mature enough such that they can see and hence invest in upfront the longer term returns that they expect to get from, from particularly an equity investment. And so I, I personally hope that development partners would play a role today that, that's much greater than they have in terms of supporting not just post-investment TA, but that pre-investment piece, but that that will lead into a, up to a point where funds like Lillian's and, and Bruce's and others can go out and raise much more capital themselves and hence have much broader management fees to take the risk up front themselves and hence take over that role from the development community over time. And I certainly see that possible in the long run but it can't happen unless you prove it. And we've had these discussions with countless funds, maybe 60, 70 different funds, who've all said, can you just do all of it yourself in-house and then bring me great deals? And I'll say, I, I can't because I can't afford to do that. And they'll, they'll say, well, no, neither can we because we can't convince our boards. And that's the role that I think would be so effective for people like USA to, to, to bridge, is, is that kind of funding facility that is cognizant of, of, of the market. So let me pause there. I'm sure everybody has an impression, and maybe Bruce and then Lillian. You know, I agree, and I, I think obviously we know that aid in the past has, has really distorted markets in, in places like Africa, and I, so 
I think playing a role of, of uh, you know, helping mitigate the, the risk uh, for investors. So, you know, for example, you know, providing first loss protection on, on a uh, TA fund or, uh, you know, providing a credit guarantee or some, you know, something along those lines where, where um, there is still risk being taken by investors and ultimately the company is as, as well. And, and so they have uh, investors and the company have skin in the game. But, but again, helping investors to take one, one step forward, helping them to uh, feel comfortable about taking maybe a smaller degree of risk. So just let's uh, move on with the last question. Um, I guess Lorna, uh, you know, the question was, what other challenges did you have aside from just the capital side that, uh, that advisors, or in this case, I suppose we were able to help with? Uh, questions you might have had about your business, your scale, operations, other things outside of the capital race. That's, I think, a live mic. Uh, yeah, um, we actually had a lot of, uh, okay, not very, but <laughs> quite a number of challenges, especially uh, considering we were, we're just a small management team. We have uh, around 40 uh, uh, employees in the company, but the management team is only four people because uh, most of the people are doing casual work, like working with the machine. So you can imagine um, just the four of us trying to be accountants, uh, HR, finance, um, operation, supervisor, uh, everything uh, in one. So there was, it, it's, it's not easy. And uh, if we dwell so much in trying to do what OCO was doing, we were going to be, uh, to maybe lose concentration in the core business. And so it was important that they came in and uh, helped us to even um, advise on who to hire. Um, they're asking other challenges like, uh, oh yeah, even on, uh, on, on planning growth strategy, like uh, they would look at what we had and uh, they would ask us to do maybe uh, more market research and come up with an uh, ideal uh, situation like uh, how, why, why we felt that that's, that industry we were going to get in easily. And we got so much work and assignment from them, but uh, uh, it was very helpful to help us actually come up with a better uh, strategy on our goal uh, and uh, long-term, medium, and actually uh, what we are doing right now to help uh, with the ramp-up that is coming up soon. Am I, I really maybe answering? Just a very, very quick anecdote to end that. I didn't get uh, it. L Lorna uh, came up to us when we said, well, how, how quickly could you sell 10 times your current capacity? And she said, I don't know. I've been approached by a million different people about buying my product. And, and we just simply had to create a template and get all those different names of potential customers down on the template and then, and then review what customer types you're looking at, what sort of discounts or marketing strategy could we use for each bucket of customers, what order should we approach those, what product should we sell to them, and working through that angle together, whereas all of it was in their heads already. So, so much of that is just helping prioritize, organize, plan, strategize, and maybe that's a quick answer to it. And also, but also, sim also as simple as just financing the purchase of a generator. I mean, there's so many businesses we come across that are in manufacturing that don't have generators, and so they can't produce product a fair amount of time, especially in the rainy season, so. Yeah. Do you have a last quick one? Also, or, or, really quick. Uh, also for choosing like machinery, we had uh, talked to over 20,000 suppliers. Okay, 20, 30. <laughs> so we were able to, we were made to actually narrow down and they helped us to choose which of the machine was going to add the most value and how much money. So there was a lot of um, interesting work that went down and then after when you now analyze the machine suppliers you actually get the one that is going to give you the most value i found that so helpful because we couldn't choose a company in china to purchase the uh, machinery that was very capital intensive just yell thank you my name is anya kunik i uh, run the social investment program at sabanji university in turkey um, my question would be to Bruce and Andreas on um, the investor's perspective. Uh, I assume that most of Lorna's investors are, are coming from abroad, or many of them. How do you see the local 
impact investment market developing? Uh, would you anticipate that maybe over the coming years we will see individuals, philanthropists, but also impact investors coming up and investing in, in Lorna's business here in, in Africa? And maybe a second question to that, what about the African diaspora? Actually, and I'll, I'll let Andrea speak to that because we asked him to help us find source potentially local investors and we weren't able to and maybe Andreas you can explain why all the capital ended up being foreign capital rather than local. You know it's and just a very brief one because we do have to wrap up but over the last couple of years as we've grown and worked with these global investors we've realized that we're able to work and we've met more and more local investors and so I would say about 50% of our investor base that we work with regularly about 80 investors are local. Uh, now some of those are, are funds that are ultimately funded by foreign capital but managed entirely locally. Others are just angel investors here. But in the angel community, there's a lot of focus around specific sectors that they know very well. And so the fit has to be perfect. But if the fit is there, it's the best source. So we've, we've closed a couple deals where we've brought in local angels. They've loved it. They've known the industries. And it's like a strategic. It's just been a beautiful match. But for many, they don't even want to be approached. It's not like their whole business is sourcing deals. Their business is running their other business, and they're quite wealthy. And so to show them opportunities becomes difficult because they don't want to see things regularly. And so the process for us is usually, is there a direct fit? And if not, will there be a fit as the business grows? And you know, I think for EcoPost, the, the person that we had in mind, actually the two that we approached, uh, were interested, but at a later stage. And they saw it as, oh, this would be great if there are a couple million dollars of turnover, if we really can merge this into our operations. And maybe at that point, it'd be an interesting exit. But early on, there wasn't a fit. And unfortunately, our exposure to that area of the market is only uh, several dozen people. So it's still limited. I think we do have to wrap up, though. So uh, thank you, everybody on the panel, and for your good questions.